the topic of this panel is the Latin America shifting political landscape, landscape in Latin America. What do voters want and what can leaders deliver? I think that every year we see elections and changes in the region, but this year in particular seems to be a hinge moment for many countries. We know that Latin America is going through a political transition after several years of relative stability. What we don't know yet is whether it is a transition and where it's heading, where the situation in the region is complex, changing. Every country has its own particular situation. However, it is difficult to avoid the temptation to say that there are regional uh, changes. There are ideological changes, as some people say, both on the left to the right, and from the right to the center, or more pragmatism. Is it a normal political cycle, what we're seeing in the region? Voters are looking for a change. They are tired of the same governments for many years. And how does corruption play into all of this? This is an issue we have heard discussed in the different sessions in politics in the region. Does it reflect a, a, a demand by the voters for more open, more transparent government? Or maybe what we are seeing is simply the product of a, a more complex environment for many countries in the region, the drop of oil prices as well as the drop in other commodities prices. So how can the governments of the region manage to take the necessary economic measures? Are they politically capable? Do they, do they have the ability to make economic changes that are necessary? Approval levels by, of some of the leaders and presidents are low, very low in many countries. There is a discontent among the populace. And uh, now are we, are we hitting? bottom and then are we going to start recovering or sh will is this is not the bottom yet and we will con will we continue to fall there are many questions and there are n we don't have enough time to uh, analyze all the countries in the region but we have taken five examples Brazil Argentina Peru Ecuador and Venezuela I am very glad to have here with us the dream team of political analysis in Latin America. And I trust that they're going to clarify all the doubts we have regarding politics in the region. They share a characteristic. All of them have made accurate political um, predictions. They have never made any mistakes. Their record is 100% perfect and they have been accurate every time they have spoken. I'm going to ask a question to each one of them to get us started with our discussion, and then we will invite you to ask questions, make comments. I see among you that there are many people who are interested in politics in the region. We will start with um, the easiest country, Brazil. Right, right, Matias? Uh, there was an impeachment uh, of uh, President Dilma Joseph. Now we have Michel Temer. Uh, former President Cardozo has said that Temer's government or Temer's administration is a fragile bridge. That's what he has called it. So uh, the question to you, Matias, is uh, how able will this government be? What can we expect? There's two years before the next presidential elections, October 2018. In a recent essay you wrote on foreign affairs, you have said that 
the problem is a, a problem of political engineering in the country. And until that time, as this problem has been solved, uh, we will continue to have other problems because this is the core issue. So what are the possibilities uh, this uh, administration that has two years uh, before the next election? So is it time enough to reform policies and to be able to stimulate the economy, which is in dire straits? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the answer, the shorter, shortest answer is that in the short term, uh, m m some ideas. In the medium term, we have more problems. Brazil is going through the most important political transition. It has uh, lived and experienced in the last 30 years. The economic crisis is brutal. There, the um, uh, um, GDP uh, has uh, shrunk, and Brazil has accumulated uh, an economic disaster after another after the economic crisis in 20 uh, in 2008. Uh, Brazil went through um, the largest uh, um, corruption scandal in the world. There's no doubt. It is hard to imagine that any government in any democracy would have survived anything similar to the corruption scandal that we've seen in Petrobras unfolding. The amount of money involved, the fact that all significant political parties are involved, and also because what this scandal has revealed is that endemic corruption is a sine qua non condition without which uh, politics do don't happen in the country. There is a problem, uh, a core problem in the institutions that lead to this dynamics. There is a, the relationship between the executive and the legislative power and how a political committee is set up in Brazil. Vis-a-vis -vis this, we also had the impeachment process that took very many months to be solved, resolved. It was resolved last week with an unusual turn of events. It is very exciting. To, it is even more exciting to watch uh, Brazilian politics unfolding than watching uh, uh, the House of Cards, the TV show. It is more exciting, I said. In the short term, there are many fast changes that need to happen. It has to do with microeconomic reforms that already had consensus both on the right and the left. These are reforms that had been expected for many years and that uh, Ms. Rousseff's um, the government could not implement, in part because of ideology and in part also because Ms. Rousseff has lost the ability to govern many months ago. These reforms are being implemented right now. We will see it in the news in the coming weeks how these reforms will be developed in the telecommunication sector, energy, privatization of airports, regulatory conversion for um, foreign investment is strengthening of regulation agencies that had been weakened over the past few years. All this agenda is relatively simple to implement. The second agenda, the agenda that is being negotiated right now but would be implemented as of next year is harder. These are structural reforms that are related to the fiscal viability of the Brazilian state, which is quite compromised. The public debt is way above the uh, extraction ability of the country. It already has 37 percent of the the national income comes from taxes. So there is a third set of reforms related to public policy, related to the ability of the Brazilian state to be able or not to maintain the income redistribution policies that during the 2000s, the, not, the odds, they were the, the hallmark of the party in, in power to take almost 40 million people above the line 
uh, of poverty and they are being pushed back down below the poverty line with all the tremendous implications that this kind of movement will have. We, uh, it's not clear what the government is planning to do regarding that second agenda. This depends on an imponderable, which is the corruption scandal that persists and continues to evolve, to unfold. Today, again, we saw a new stage in this new process, which I reiterate involves all political parties as well as the political party of the current president and essential members of this president's coalition. So in this context, of course, we have uh, the more worrisome Brazil. To give you an idea, in the last statistics, we see that half of the uh, Brazilian population has no access to treated water. Last year in Brazil, uh, we have was 59,000 homicides uh, to, uh, uh, caused by firearms, and so more people died in Brazil than in Syria and Iraq put together. The governance model is poor, very poor, but the light at the end of the tunnel is that perhaps this process of exposing the, the, the underbelly of corruption, this will open up a, a, a situation toward the future that will make it less fragile. Thank you, Matias. Uh. Argentina. So let us go now to Argentina. Carlos. President Macri arrived in December last year to the presidency. And I think that everyone was impressed with how rapidly he uh, rearranged things, things that were approved by the Congress and very substantial progress. Now we're at the second semester and uh, we're looking toward 2017 when there will be very important uh, election in Argentina. In La Nación newspaper, you've written that the two most important challenges in order to make Argentina more competitive and to improve institutional transparency, uh, uh, how do you think uh, President Macri is doing as far as the management of these uh, challenges? What margin does he have? since the Congress is in the hands of the opposition. What margin does it have to make any progress? How do you assess his government uh, in recent days, particularly uh, from the standpoint of politics? The first thing I'd like to say is thank you so very much for the invitation to attend this very important meeting, both as regards uh, the dialogue and the CAF, CAF. I would like to summarize uh, the answer to your question, which is truly challenging and touches on many aspects. First thing we have to look at in Argentina is the rarity of everything that has happened. We're going through an externally peculiar situation for the uh, political tradition and of the country. For the first time in history, we have a government that doesn't have a majority of the House of Representatives in both houses. The first time it doesn't have a majority in the House of Representatives. For the first time in history, for second time rather in history, for the second time in history, a non-Peronista party has uh, gained the province of Buenos Aires competing against Peronismo. This is very out of the order. 45% um, of the riches and 70% of the province of Argentina are right there in the province of Buenos Aires. The main question last year, if I were here, you would be asking me, how is it that Macri will manage to get to power without the province of Buenos Aires and to govern without the support of Buenos Aires? If I were to answer that he was going to attain power because of Buenos Aires and govern together with it, you would have put me um, on a plane and sent me back to Argentina. So with this, he has acquired much power, but there is a terribly complicated agenda and this is why uh, people voted for Macri in Buenos Aires with a tremendous contamination between politics and crime. I will refer to this later on, and I would like to establish a point of comparison with Brazil. It is a coalition government, a country which is not accustomed to coalition experiences, where the last coalition experience failed. 
in something which is very peculiar, a country whose coalition is controlled by a new party that was born within an impeachment of the policies of the crisis 2001. Macri's party is a country which is neither radical nor peronista. It is a country that was born within the tremendous collapse of representation, particularly of intermediate sectors, the collapse of radicalism back in 2001. A country headed by an entrepreneur and a country which rejects and penalizes riches and wealth. A country with a tremendous cultural mistrust toward capitalism. And which uh, who reaches power for the first time in history because of a ballot surprise, a ballotage, where they lose in the first round. Most of the votes on Macri were votes against Kirchnerismo instead of votes for Macri. But all of this is something which is truly fragile to come to grips and to grapple with a serious problem, which is how to reorganize the economy, which has reached uh, inflation levels and a problem of collapse in the reserves of the central bank, poverty levels uh, in keeping with inflation levels, a level of external isolation financially, which was very important. How to redress all of this economy, to reorganize it with uh, such tentative and hesitating instruments and with an information which is paramount to understand what is happening today in Argentina. Popular, populism of Kirchnerismo didn't actually burst. In Argentina, there's always a, an argument, and that is that if the uh, Kirchnerista experience were to continue, would reach figures like those we have today in Venezuela. But we never reach those figures. So to an extent, the reordering adjustment of Macri has been competing against the hypothesis and not against something that was verified in practice. And this makes it even more difficult. In the light of these problems, I think his, his success has truly been extraordinary. Unified the exchange rate in less than 72 hours, when everybody thought that we were going to have a um, uh, monetary run like we've seen earlier. Today, people are concerned because this is lagging behind. Instead of having a monetary run, he had an agreement to hold out so the majority in the Senate uh, contributed by Peronismo. And he did away with that agreement without any scandal in the month of April, managed to bring about or to go through a process that would result in a drop of real wages because of the recession that comes after any inflationary process without a great conflict on the trade union front, which is very important in Argentina, for it is indeed one of the fronts in which Peronismo has greater rooting. He managed to conduct all these agreements with an, an agreement with the governors, who are mostly Peronistas, who did not agree with the guidelines presented by Cristina Kirchner anymore. And it is also true that the second semester to which Michael has referred is somewhat ironic, because the government offered that during the second semester the economy would flourish. Of course, they say that economists should not say what, but and if they don't should say when, and if they say when, they shouldn't say how. But they made the mistake of saying both when and how. Well, that would say it would be the, the second semester. Inflation started to go down significantly. And uh, around these days, a piece of information came up is that the cement uh, uh, production had an increase with regard to the previous month of 9%. So there is some surges of reanimation, re uh, flourishing in the economy. Let me conclude by saying that most of the legitimacy and consensus gained by the government was obtained because of a re rejection of Kirchnerismo and a rejection to the corruption boom that was represented is now represented by Kirchnerismo. And I say now because when they were in government, we did not learn about what was going on because of different reason than Brazil. The federal corrupt in Argentina is highly corrupt. They waited for the government to change, to sanction those uh, officials who was evident had committed many irregularities. This establishes a great difference with Brazil. It is very different indeed. In Argentina, we had a case that was quite notorious of a secretary of public works, the man 
who was in charge of the public works during 12 years, who arrived at 3 in the morning in a convent in the country of the Pope, by the way, the Pope's country, and he threw over the wall $10 million, which he cannot explain how he obtained them. Well, this man has a windmill profit denunciation uh, for many years, and nobody had ever said anything in the past. If he was able to make the $10 million, it's because the judge was also uh, accepting that situation. This is a tremendous issue in Argentina, which calls for a special program, which uh, is perhaps less well uh, uh, less clear than the economic program. Uh, Macri's government has the dangers of a technocracy that by a confused public life with administrative life, instead of uh, hearing that he received a, a mandate, which is that of separating criminality from politics. The great power test will be the elections next year, particularly in the province of Buenos Aires. Having one of uh, Buenos Aires is the bad news, or entails the bad news, that he will have to win it once again. Here we will resolve the great doubt in the case of Argentina, the greatest question mark in the last 15 years. Throughout the last 15 years, the great news was not Kirchnerismo, but rather the collapse of radicalism. The intermediate sectors of society, the most competitive sectors on which depended the least on the state, which were more open, lost their representation instrument, their tool of representation. What is questioned at this point in this hesitating Argentina because of these rarities I just mentioned is that if we change the coalition of Macri, will this be a representation instrument or not? How solid is it to offer once again the intermediate sectors that were made piecemeal during the ele elections an instrument of true intervention in the political uh, system that will give a new pathway for the country to follow? This will be the great question mark in the elections of next year, particularly in the province of Buenos Aires. And what we do not know yet is whether the agenda for that election will be changed or continuity, whether Kirchnerismo will still be prevailing as a negative element for the vote, whether it is going to be a plebiscite of Macri's agenda. And there, what it will be very important is the level of growth of the economy next year. Thank you very much, Carlos. Mercosur. Now let's go to the from Mercosur to the Andean region, Peru. Alberto PP. Pepeca has just uh, out of the, all the countries uh, it, it is uh, uh, here represented is the country with the highest uh, uh, growth rate the uh, uh, new president is um, has high levels of approval I don't even know why we included uh, you in this panel. He spoke about a uh, social revolution during his inaugural speech. However, in the history of Peru and in Latin America, he won uh, with very few votes uh, because people were voting against Fujimori more than in favor of him. He has very little representation in Congress. Uh, so uh, what are the prospects for his government at this point in time? The signals are encouraging, at least looking from the outside in and so uh, in and within the regional context. But you uh, it, it is not easy to understand Peru and Peru and the president does not come from deep in Peru. So what are the challenges and what can we expect? regarding um, politics in Peru in the next few years. Thank you very much above all. And of course, yes, I'd love to be able to start and uh, enthrall the uh, audience here and telling you here, oh, there's something really rare going on in my country. But no, no, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary is happening in my country. I thought it was generous to include Peru here. Yes, if one hears um, uh, what we have been listening to from the beginning of the sessions uh, here, uh, what we are living in Cuba, uh, uh, and also the historic moment in Colombia, 
uh, to end that uh, internal war, etc. Then we have the situation in Venezuela and Ecuador where there are both political and economic crises going on. Of course, in Peru, we don't have anything uh, like it, but we would say rather than what is surprising in, in Peru is the absence of surprises. And of course, we see a change of administration in post-boom context in Latin America, which is quite peculiar. Uh, Ambassador Wagner uh, in the last panel said that a country that will maintain a significant uh, growth rate, 4 percent this year, 4 percent uh, for next year, and in fact, uh, for the fourth time consecutively, is this the first or second time? But let's see, we've not seen it often that we have had four uh, presidents elected consecutively. And uh, in addition, in terms of political continuity, let's say that it is encouraging to see that uh, Fujimorism, which lost the election by 40,000 votes uh, in a universe of 20 million voters, in it, it, although it is a populist, authoritarian kind party, has accepted the results of the elections they have, accepted the decision of the electoral organs, uh, and this speaks well of authorities in Peru. So these two positive signs tell us that there is some health in the country. Uh, so uh, yes, this is, is a reason for enthusiasm uh, for me, for uh, Ambassador Wagner, etc., and others around here is not uh, good news or great news for Peruvians in general, because what we have is a country which people have voted massively by the for the candidate that will change that economic uh, um, model 52 percent in 2011 52 percent votes in, in in 2011 and we have a country in addition with uh, dissatisfaction rates which are the highest in Latin America among the people. So underneath that celebration, there is bitterness among the people, which is in the fringes of the enthusiasm exhibited by the political elites. Why does this happen? I believe that, especially because problems are related not to the economic issue, but to uh, the issues of politics and institutions, and to um, paraphrase uh, Bill Clinton, it's it's not the economy stupid. So there are three dimensions that, in my view, where we have the challenges in Peru, the um, uh, rule of law, insecurity, uh, illegal activity is great, and serious problems of representation. Of course, this is a whole universe, and we would need to have a, another panel for that discussion. But I think there are a serious deficiencies in the Peruvian system that maintain uh, what has been gained uh, with the stability and politics in the country in still a, sta a state that is challenging and precarious. To deal with the forgotten dimensions, uh, there has been a lot of self-congratulatory feel in Peru. However, we need to uh, do away with a series of paradigms, uh, theories of modernization, as we call them, that social and economic processes by themselves are going to solve a series of problems in other levels of the country, that institutions, uh, that uh, social relations will improve because there is economic growth. This has been the ideological uh, paradigm that has uh, ruled in Peru. And there is uh, mysticism when they talk about the GDP and they think, oh, it is so magnificent. But that's not where the problem is. And uh, we need to recover a more political and institutional dimension 
in our country, which has been a more a managed country, more in 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 an it is an incarnation and of the um, a great deal of administration, great deal of management, but too little politics as Porfirio Diaz uh, from Mexico used to say. So can Pe Pepe can't do this? Well, yes and no, because many of the problems that prevent the uh, um, national governance and governability, if there were to be a crisis tomorrow outside Lima, the government would have a great difficulty to get there. How do they connect with people outside Lima? And this is a problem that will uh, come to pass eventually. We have a weak state in Latin America and that is not solved by a change of administration, but there is room for improvement. I think for the time being, uh, Pedro Pablo Puczynski has shown interest to uh, have a Republican institutionalist um, um, approach. So we cannot do a lot of forecasting from the speeches that have been given, but it seems that there is concern for more institutional dimensions. I think that the Minister of Interior has come in with, by making a, a decision to reform the National Police and other um, uh, uh, Interior Ministry affairs, and the issue is that that he needs a political backing, which is n necessary. But politicians many times don't achieve this in Peru. Uh, during the prior government, there were seven ministers of interior. So there's no continuity whatsoever in the policies in that sector. And so it's not by chance that security deteriorates and that this poisons the well in the rest of the social um, um, environment. So uh, certain political wills, certain uh, recent measures, a different tone, a different uh, a difference in what has been done in the country before. And this in, for Pedro uh, or um, PPK as he's called, it, it, it there are two contrasts from Ollantamala, who was uh, an absent president, basically. He was just in gray tones, and Puczynski appears as a statesman uh, by comparison. Another one who was a true um, nightmare, and it, and it was, was the uh, great scare that Fujimori was going to become president. So uh, people were scared witless. And so many people uh, tend to think that the new administration, Buczynski, is positive and there's optimism. So uh, we have that, but then there is uh, uh, there are other issues that still are there. Uh, and. Um, what we need is to work on those reforms. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad we included you in the panel after all. Now we will give the floor to our next speaker. I think President Correa Adrian was uh, elected 10 years ago in November 2006. He's been 10 years in, in office in Ecuador. The decade before Correa, there were several presidents. So we've seen uh, this uh, political shining in the last decade. But this means that this is coming to an end. There will be an election next year. And of course, President Correa is open. He says that he's not going to run again. You can tell us something about that, perhaps. But the political uh, outlook has changed, and the economic situation is quite serious, as well as the drop in the prices of oil that has had a bad impact upon the Ecuadorian economy. In view of this new context, a figure such as that of Correa, who has controlled the country with Alianza, his party, it seems that this decade uh, starts to see some changes economically. And what can we await to see in Ecuador in the, in the near future? Can you tell us? 
Thank you, Michael, for your invitation, and thank to CAF. I'd like to thank Enrique Garcia, not just for inviting us, but the more than two decades that he's been uh, in charge of the institution, I've been made of this a financial instrument, one of uh, development for Latin America, around which there are different uh, processes of integration, which allows for our region to continue to forge ahead. Indeed, in the case of Ecuador, what we are witnessing is how is it that the political scenario, the political cycle is transformed as a result of the end of the political cycle in that country and in Latin America as a whole. The political cycle, if we think in terms of public policies, is over because the policies of the government of President Correa and or any other countries that might come after him would have to be very much concerned with the fiscal crisis, and this entails a cost upon other public policies, particularly social policies, and the capability that the state was able to develop in last in recent years of subsidizing and feeding the rest of society, economically speaking. Administration President Correa leaves an important legacy. First, these have been 10 years of stability. After almost 15 of political disarray and instability in Ecuador. It is an administration that leaves a legacy in infrastructure. Throughout these 10 years, the capacity of the public sector had to build roads, hospitals, schools, and uh, to finance other types of infrastructure for health was indeed uh, very, very important. It is a government that also leaves uh, an unprecedented legacy in Ecuador with regard to public policies conducive to the inclusion of sectors that formerly had no access to much of the public goods of society. And finally, it is indeed an administration that will be recognized at some point in time in history for it uh, attempted to strengthen the regulatory capacity of the state and the intervening capabilities of the state under circumstances where in the past Ecuador could have been caused as an anomic society because of the fragmentation that its society was going through. So in the last 10 years, all of this was built upon the foundation of extraordinary economic income, also on the basis of greater historic prosperity in the country as a result of the economic cycle that benefited uh, South America in general, particularly Ecuador, not just with regard to its energy export goods and commodities, but also the agricultural exports. It had its consequences, perhaps not intended consequences, for the public sector, which at the beginning of Correa's administration was about 21% of the GDP, and it ends uh, by having 44% of the GDP. So, much of the Ecuadorian income uh, comes from oil exports, which are controlled and regulated by the state in one way or the other. At some point, um, um, Ecuadorian oil during Correa's administration was sold as more, at more than $110 a barrel. Last year, Ecuadorian oil was sold at a little more than $20, $20 a barrel. Now the price of Ecuadorian oil is around $40 a barrel. This mm, represents a dramatic decline in the income of the state. And if we look at how the state and the public sector represents 44% of the GDP, we see that what we're coming across now is a situation where there's been a retraction of all of the economic factors. And this prosperity is no longer there. We find ourselves in Ecuador nowadays in a situation of shortages, shortages and scarcity, which uh, threaten the continuity of the political model and of the rhetoric of uh, the government of President Correa's a government that was reelected twice within a certain context and which has to be explained within the Ecuadorian context itself, which is one of a society which historically was excluding, it was a discriminating society having a racist moral approach 
that um, accounts for a situation of inequality. This is the backdrop that explains not just the public policies, but also the success of President Correa himself, a piecemeal society this, and which lacks values, nomic. But all of this sets forth a situation from the electoral standpoint where the income is insufficient. Correa promoted a reform to change the constitution and allow for the indefinite election of all positions of public officials. But um, a few months after that reform was approved by a national assembly with uh, some 110 of 129 votes, he decides not to present himself. What were the political forces? What are the political forces at this point in time? Those of the government in of the power in office, where there would have been a consolidation of uh, two members, and this is what was informed, made up by the two ex-vice presidents of Correa, Vice President Lenin Moreno, as well as the current Vice President Jorge Glass. That would be, those would be the two names, which are facing an opposition which is quite diverse. It goes from radical left all the way to the most radical right, where the um, scenarios uh, tell us about the possibility of a continuity of the Ecuadorian political scenario and the government forces provided it can win during the first round. In Ecuador, you win with 40% of the votes. If the winning candidate has a difference of more than 10 points with regard to the second position. If the candidate of the Pais uh, movement would not win during the first round, the second one would make it very difficult because in keeping with many of the surveys, if not all of them, most of the population over 50 percent in this case would not be wagering for the continuity of the political model. So the possibility of winning does exist and the possibility of winning easily in the first round uh, according to recent polls, tell us, and there are very many differences and variations uh, according to the ones who are conducting the surveys and the polls. But the government candidate has about 40 percent, while the two other options after that, center right or right, are very far behind. The first one having 16 percent, the former presidential candidate Guillermo Lasso who four years ago got 28% of the vote, and also the candidacy of a coalition of groups around the strongest of them, which is the Social Christian Party of the mayor of Guayaquil, most important city in economic terms of Ecuador with largest population, which is a, a member of the assembly, Cynthia Literice, who would have some 12% of the vote. The center left has very few options for this type of voters have been already captured by President Correa. So this is the political backdrop. However, no matter what the government will be, there will be a continuation of the país, of the país movement or the opposition. They will have to face a dramatic fiscal reality. And they will have to assume policies of adjustment that will, in the field of public policies, reverse uh, the political cycle. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Adrian. Wonderful. But not least. <laughs> As we say in English, last but not least, now we will go to Venezuela. Several days ago, almost a week ago, there was a significant march in Caracas by the opposition, apparently uh, 30,000 uh, people attended. Others say it was a million, but uh, you know, numbers are numbers. They Everything is the same ultimately. But Luis Vicentes, you have written about the march was, necess was not necessary to prove that the opposition has a majority in the country. Surveys say as much in the last year's elections in December. That was also proven, but they don't have power. 
so we are a situation where they are at an impasse. The opposition, or it is a question, can the opposition maintain the pressure that was shown in December? And from the standpoint of the government, can the government or will the government just let the clock a, a, a clock a run its course, uh, let things just uh, uh, expire, and uh, if we go to next year, then will not be the effect of a change of uh, government. So you have very good, um, clear analyses, but please uh, tell us. Uh, what will happen? The crisis is there, but the question is when when will the crisis end and how? In two minutes. Well, yes, I, I have uh, um, several uh, more rarities to share with you in the case of Venezuela. Uh, there, we don't need to see a great deal of participation in Caracas with the huge uh, march to point out that the government has issues with the uh, populace. We have seen it in every single survey. They all show the same. We've, we've seen it in the electoral results which took place, the elections were dis last December, and situation back there was much better in Venezuela than it is right now. So, of course, there was a problem of connection, of popularity in the Venezuelan government, and the opposition becomes a majority force. The crisis is the main driver of this. Of course, we're talking about not a minority or or a, or a secondary crisis. It's the worst crisis that Venezuela has experienced from the federal ward up to this point. We had never been in a point uh, at a point of economic crisis. Our, we have the highest inflation rate in the world and the highest in in its history. There is no supply of food, of medicines, a decrease in investment, and also a loss of purchasing power among the people in Venezuela. So 92% of Venezuelans, including Chavistas, independents, opposition, feel the country is doing poorly or very poorly. And this perception of a crisis affects the popularity both of the government and of President Maduro. How much does this affect it? The popularity of the president in uh, August was 21% of pop, uh, people approval, uh, popular approval. 80% of the Venezuelan population uh, say they want change, change in the economic model, change in politics. So, of course, the crisis explains a perception that builds on a, a, a negative impact on the president and the government. So what happens with this? If we were in a regular country, well, simply the country will, the president would have popularity problems. There would be some governance problems, but they would, be, the president would be able to do his work until the next elections when um, there would be a change and people will vote, etc. However, there is a, a potential of um, to revoke the president. The, there can be a referendum and they can revoke the power of the president and others. And let me make clear that when this likelihood was incorporated or was proposed to be incorporated in the last constitution signed in Venezuela, I vote against it because you shouldn't have a, a um, a revocation uh, referendum. Uh, we shouldn't have to subject a country to this process. However, the country voted uh, in favor of this referendum, which was proposed by President Chavez and Chavismo. They proposed that possibility the ability to go to a referendum that would revoke the power from the president. And so, whether 
you think the, res the right exists or not is good or bad, that's moot because the fact is that exists. And the constitutional right is there to call the referendum and try to win that referendum. So uh, when the Constitution was established, Chavismo uh, thought it was the maximum expression of democracy to have this kind of referendum uh, toward uh, revocation. But today, they think that there is a coup d'etat if they call this referendum. So of course, people change their minds. But of course, the numbers indicate that the likelihood that uh, President Maduro wins uh, this referendum is a, 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 a limit tending to zero because it means that it's not possible really that the president would win this uh, referendum uh, given the situation right now. Maybe things will change uh, within a few months, but today this referendum would be won by the opposition today. I, I'm not talking about a specific leader, but uh, the fact that people want to change President Maduro and have him go, that will leave the referendum to be won by the opposition. This year, the Constitution says that we would need to call a, 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 president, a presidential election within 30 days. If the president loses the referendum, then 30 days later in a presidential election, well, the results would be the, the same, no matter what. Uh, a Chavista would never win that election under the current circumstances. So something that could be positive uh, in other terms, then it becomes a negative. Uh, now, a referendum would mean that the revolution would be exiting power if that referendum happens right now. Again, in a regular everyday country, that would be different. But if constitutionality works, then things would take their course. But in Venezuela, things are much more complicated in the institutionality that would guarantee the constitutional right response to the revolution more than to the constitution. And when you respond more to revolution than to constitution, obviously the government can use their powers and their institutional control to lengthen, to block, to delay that constitutional process of the referendum. Up until when? We don't know. Maybe it could be forever, but uh, for now it makes sense or seems to make sense that the government would like to um, forget about 2016. And why? Because if that referendum occurs in 2017, the Constitution says that you're not convoking um, an, a presidential election, but that the president will end his term, in which case if there were a referendum next year, Chavismo won't leave power, but they will remain in power until the the next presidential elections in 2019, which of course will be less serious for them than were this to happen this year, 2016. So keeping this in mind, what do we have? The government, the National Electoral College and the Supreme Tri Tribunal have consistently delayed and blocked the process. Um, uh, along the way, then what happens? We have a country where the battle is not an institutional battle anymore because uh, no matter how many lawyers you take to the Supreme um, uh, uh, Tribunal of Justice, it, what you need is somebody who gives things to you. And so you can write whatever you want, whatever documents and papers, because you're – so this battle is not an institutional battle. It becomes a political battle. And what we have in Venezuela today is a political battle where the opposition feels they need to pressure and pressure through um, – demonstrations, marches, civil disobedience, and some radical groups among the opposition who feel they want to also act with violence to look for a mechanism for change. And so we have all of that there. So this is a political battle, let me remind you again. So there is a search of um, 
uh, having marches and demonstrations. What happened September 1st, that demonstration is a quantum leap in the position of the opposition because now the opposition are uh, are demonstrating because they, they are peacefully vis-a-vis -vis the government and they're telling the government, I'm going to defend my constitutional right and I will go all over the country using all the um, mechanisms I can peacefully to pressure and pressure so that this becomes a negotiation that will lead to referendum and it will be a political negotiation. And why do I say that the Thursday march was so important? It's important because the opposition has seen three stages throughout these uh, 17 years of Chavismo. A first stage where the opposition was a minority, clearly a minority, where President Chavez was the categoric um, majority. The opposition could uh, hold marches, even larger marches, marches than the one we saw Thursday. But it, they were hyper-motivated, hyper-mobilized, even though they were a minority. But there was a second stage where when they became a majority, they become demobilized. And the leaders, the most important of which was not able to fill a, a, a square in a town. So while being a majority, representing the majority of the country, they had no mobilization ability. And what happened last Thursday was that for the first time, this is a, an ideal situation for the majority. They are able to motivate people, they can mobilize people, and they can stir the population. And this is a change and a huge opportunity for the opposition. But then we have a perverse uh, question. So what next? Well, yes, they mobilized 1 million, 30,000. It doesn't matter. I do not believe there were 1 million out there. And of course, there were not. 30,000 either. But technically, there were lots and lots of people. A huge amount of people was there. And it doesn't matter if there were 200, 200,000, a million. It is a change with respect to the past where the opposition was not able to mobilize the people. Now they can have that convocation power. People are coming to see, to listen. And this it takes us to three likely scenarios. My wife is a total radical, and she goes out. Uh, yes, opposition runs through her veins. And she would say, yes, that's it. That's the end. My Ludo will be out in three days. And so this is one of the positions. However, if I have to analyze this objectively, I have to understand that there are at least three scenarios, and th this will be the end. The first scenario is the least comfortable, the one my wife likes the least. The one my wife likes the least is basically that despite the fact that you're able to mobilize the people, despite the fact that you move the people for an event, that event may become a one-shot deal, uh, just something that does not concretize in something into the future. We need to see how it unfolds. True, there's an opportunity there. Yes, true, people are demonstrating because the crisis is horrible. Yes, it's true, the opposition is not only the opposition of political parties. It's people seeking change. They want to punish those who they consider to be responsible for the crisis. So the encouragement for that opposition is there. But they're, they may just lose interest along the way. Like a, a, a balloon, they will lose their air if you tired people and then they give up. If you start looking for mechanisms or, or there are internal issues, then the opposition will demobilize. And will you go back to the second stage where even though you're the majority, you don't have pressure to exercise. The second scenario is they achieve their actual objective goal, a peaceful push, pressure, because what can really change things is not pressure to go to Miraflores on a march, but brutal opposition that forces the government to renegotiate so that they can return the constitutional right 
Yeah, it's ugly to say that you have to negotiate a constitutional right, but that's what it is, really. A, a, a debate among adversaries, sacrificing things to solve a problem. That pressure process could happen if it is well handled and if all the conditions are given for the opposition to remain there on the streets so that they have a, a, a great uh, ability to pressure the government and the press and the government is against the wall and is forced to negotiate and the military understand that there are risks to try to control a volcano that is about to erupt so there's the third scenario and it is this something that may be very positive can go overboard into violence if that crosses that line toward violence and radicalization and this could happen either because uh, a radical group uh, encourages them if they feel that all the rest are just being clowns and that because there is no way to negotiate anything peacefully and then they will go violent or it could go the other way maybe the government or some extremists within the government which are also divided that feel they need to be protected from opposition that is endangering them if it ends in violence then the problem is big and the problem is who controls an anarchy caused by violence in Venezuela. It's not just any any place, and this is hard to explain to my wife. Violence in radicalization and anarchy are easier to control when you have weapons, organization, and leaders. Leadership is something which, comparing the two forces that exist currently in Venezuela, does not seem to favor the opposition in the short term. So the violence, which could be an expectation or a desire by many actors that wish uh, to, for change, could become a, a negative element to achieve uh, an objective of change, especially uh, of democratic and peaceful change that the opposition would want. Thank you very much. So you're not going to be answering my question anyway. Wonderful. Thank you, Luis Vicente. Lamentable. Regrettably, we have too many topics, and I know that many people would like to ask questions, and I would like to continue for hours and end, but we have to close this because we have still one more panel. So you can go on and speak with the five in case they want to ask questions informally. I wish to thank uh, Carlos, Matias, Alberto, Adrian, and Luis Vicente for their excellent, very clear presentations, and also to commend you for your Spanish, which is truly impeccable. Thank you so very much.